and welcome to Good Games Spawn Point, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Barjo. And I'm Hex. And I am Darren. Ugh. Is everything okay, Darren? Uh, just a slight technical issue, Hex. I've completely run out of internal storage space, so my head's feeling just a little tight. But Darren, you've got a four petabyte drive. That's enough for 50 years worth of Spawn Point episodes. What's maxed you out this week? The name of this week's Naruto game, Barjo. It's tipped me over the edge. Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm Revolution. <sighs> Oh. There we go, Darren. I cleared out some cat videos to make some space. Oh, oh fluffy. <laughs> well, also on the show this week, we tried to rule the galaxy in Star Wars Commander, a new mobile game. Plus, I'll be taking a little journey with Goose for a special postcard. Mm. Uh, but first, it's time to test your video game brain spawnlings with a Darren's Challenge! I'm asking you, which home console launched with the video game Fusion Frenzy? Hmm, answer at the end of the show, Darren. Affirmative. All right, well, let's see what news Goose has at the news desk. Thanks, guys. Goose here with all the gaming news from around the world. A new world record has been set for the classic arcade game Donkey Kong. Robbie Lakeman became the new King of Kong when he achieved a score of 1.14 million in a session that lasted almost four hours. The Donkey Kong high score is highly sought after, largely owing to the 2008 documentary The King of Kong. Congratulations, Robbie. Neuroscientists have demonstrated the possibility of brain-to-brain -brain communication between humans. Complex headwear is used to convert a user's brainwaves into a digital signal, which is then transported via the internet and decoded at the other end. With this technology, two people, one in India and the other in France, were able to greet each other using only their brains, despite being 8,000 kilometres apart. And that reminds me, I've been working on a little prototype of my own. <coughs> now, I'll see if I can send a message to you all at home. Bear with me. Hello, spoilings. I just wanted to let you know that Darren is a noob. Ah. <laughs> Hope that worked. <laughs> anyway, that's all the news for this week. Back to you guys in the studio. Ah, oh, my head hurts a bit. I think it needs some tinkering. Yeah. Thanks, Goose. All right, guys, now it's time to go to a galaxy far, far away. Bajo, the odds of a good Star Wars game are 3,720 to 1 against. Never tell me the odds, Darren. <laughs> the name's Han Solo. Maybe you've heard of me. The Empire would find your skills useful. Star Wars Commander is essentially Clash of Clans with a Star Wars skin. You'll be given a base where you'll build up troops, join squads, and battle other players. You'll collect credits and alloy, and can use the premium currency, crystals, to speed things up. After a short tutorial, you'll need to choose between the Rebel Alliance or the Galactic Empire, with each side giving you a different base and troops. I, of course, chose the Rebel Alliance because I always like to go for the good guys. Well, I went for the Galactic Empire, which gave me some pretty cool units, such as AT-ATs and TIE Fighters. Yeah, I have to say I was a bit jealous. The Empire troops are definitely a bit cooler. Buildings unlock at different HQ levels too, which gives Empire players an early game advantage with two unit transports and a factory. This means they can build bigger armies and make powerful vehicle units like ATSTs and hover tanks. Yeah, I found these vehicles particularly useful. Their attacks are powerful and they soak up a decent amount of damage. The Rebels, on the other hand, get a hero command earlier, allowing the enlistment of well-known characters, including Han Solo, Chewbacca and Leia. Yeah, and they're pretty powerful too. For example, Han Solo can take out an enemy base pretty much by himself. Would you say that Han Solo can do it solo? <laughs> Good one, Darren. However, these heroes can't be used in campaign missions, only in PvP, which means you'll start to struggle as your tiny army can't compete with more fortified enemy bases. I do like that they've tried to put in a fairly fleshed out story campaign though. It does a decent job of guiding you through some attacks and defences, as well as building up your base. There are also special time limited campaigns you can participate in to unlock special units. 
a nice touch. Yeah, you'll also be visited by the likes of Princess Leia, Han Solo and Darth Vader, who are all adequately voice acted. And that little bit of dialogue is a nice addition to a mobile game. Failure will not be tolerated. Whilst it is nice to see all these familiar faces, especially the droids, the AI in the game is a bit broken. Yes, it's as useless as a womp rat in Beggar's Canyon. The trope movements just seem so random. I'd have guys attacking walls instead of walking around them, or walking right up to a target to fire, even though they have a ranged weapon. Well, they are stormtroopers, Bajo. Historically, they do have pretty bad aim. I still find it hard to believe that a stormtrooper would fire at a wall while someone else is firing at them. <laughs> It is hard to predict where your troops will attack or run, which is frustrating. And I found quite a few of these quirks. For example, you can build a research center to upgrade your troops, but you can't research anything until you upgrade to level two. Yeah, and you can only build a certain number of turrets across all turret types. You can swap existing turrets to different types, but it will cost almost as much as it originally took to build it. And there are some campaign missions you can pass, even if you've epically failed the battle. I mean, that's just weird. These things aren't game breakers per se, but there are areas where the game could have been refined or mechanics could have been better explained. And when put together, they all make for an underwhelming experience. But it's not all bad. The sound and the graphics are quite nice, and I just love the sounds of those classic lasers. <gasps> you too. <laughs> pew pew. <laughs> The more side-on perspective is nice, but it does make it a little bit difficult to see where things need to be placed. Mm, affirmative. The camera swings around to a more top-down angle in the edit mode, but the system is clunky. Buildings are placed along grid lines, creating a white no-build zone around them. However, it's not always clear where you can and cannot build, and it just feels unnecessarily messy. Yeah, and I feel like it's a bit of a common theme with this game. Things are always just so close to working, but it just doesn't quite nail it, so I'm giving it 5 out of 10. Yeah, it's pretty rough, but I think if you're a Star Wars fan, you still might get a kick out of it, so I'm giving it 6 out of 10. Well, that's enough intergalactic war. I'm off to a realm of whimsy! Oh, it's time to do a postcard with Goose! Bye! Bye. Bye. Hmm. Wonder what they're going to talk about today. Yeah, I wonder. Hmm. Oh, Darren, I can't tell you how excited I am for our first postcard of the year. What's on the itinerary? Are we taking the train to Terraria or, or maybe catching the bus to Batman's Manor? Uh, well, Goose, I did have a wonderful location in mind, but I've run into a small hiccup in our travel arrangements. Oh, no, Darren, you didn't forget to book me a ticket, did you? Because I'm not cramming myself in your luggage again. That was a very unenjoyable experience. Well, uh, not exactly. You see, the thing is, to travel to this location, we have to go deep inside your dreams, Goose. My dreams? But, Darren, how on earth are we going to do that? Well, I've been working that out, and I thought I could build some sort of dream-inducing sleep motivator which will allow me to synchronise my digital consciousness with your state of cerebral stasis. It's all quite fascinating, really. You see, I could actually map out your neural pathways using a complex algorithm that charts the... Yes. Well, that works, too. My turn. Sleep mode activated. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> Oh, wake up, Goose. We're here. Mm. Welcome to Rayman's homeworld, the Glade of Dreams. Oh. oh, wow, Darren. I've always wanted to visit this world. It's so full of crazy colour and wild imagination. And, and to think it was all just dreamed up in the single thought of the world's creator, Polocus, the Bubble Dreamer. Affirmative. It was said that Polocus's power was so great that his every thought or desire became a reality. Uh, which explains just why the world is such a crazy mix of weird and wonderful environments, ranging from the lush, gibberish jungles to the scorching hot kitchen levels of the Gourmand land. A and while the glade itself was never mentioned in Rayman's first adventure, the world slowly grew with each new game until it was finally pieced together as one giant landmass encompassing the whole Rayman universe. Set within the Sea of Lums, the Glade of Dreams is actually a large island that was first officially charted in Rayman 2 The Great Escape, where it was originally named by its French developers as Le Crosseur de Rives, or The Crossroad of Dreams. Oh, oui, oui, Goose, oui, oui. Oh. 
And while it was also the setting for Rayman's third outing in Hoodlum Havoc, both the English and the French names of the Glade never appeared in game until the reinvigorated and recrafted Rayman Origins. Oh yes, and what a beautiful reintroduction to such a wonderful world it was. It was here that we were also introduced to the Snoring Tree, the resting place for Polocus himself and a safe haven for Rayman and his friends to hang out before setting off amongst the many islands within the archipelago of the Glade. Unfortunately, just like a dream, fun and happy can abruptly transform into dark and scary in the Glade, which is also inhabited by all sorts of unusual and dangerous creatures. These two were said to have been spawned from the mind of Polocus, who, when having his first bad dream, unintentionally created the evil Jano, guardian of the Cave of Bad Dreams. And don't forget the Glade's nightmarish underworld, the land of the livid dead, home to all those cranky undead beings who aren't fans of dreaming or sleeping or even snoring for that matter. Indeed. And as well as kidnapping Rayman and his pals, they captured and imprisoned the Electoons, tiny pink happy energy beings who gravitate around the great Protoon, a giant orb responsible for holding the very world together. The Glade itself is also supplied with harmony and balance by the heart of the world, thrown room to the Teensies, another happy race of fun-loving little creatures. For a world dreamed up in the mind of a crazy bearded man, the Glade of Dreams certainly is a meticulously well thought out and well crafted world. Wait, crazy bearded man? Darren, are you talking about me or Polocus? Oh, uh, well, actually, you're just getting confused, Goose. You see, you have a unique brain which gives off epsilon waves when you're asleep. This creates a reality-distorting effect in your thalamus, warping the effect of... There he goes. Ha! <laughs> Dodge that question. The Glade of Dreams. It's a sleepy little town. Thanks, Goose and Darren. OK, well, Barjo, plenty of questions to get into this week. And first up, it's this one from Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Expert, who is in Trevor Downtown in South Australia. Hmm. Yeah! Good game. I am the Mystery Dungeon Master. Do you know how to get more rare cards on Card Wars? Please answer. Hex is awesome, and Barjo, you are going to get hit. Charge! Oh. oh, well, Mr. Dungeon Expert, there are three ways you can get rare cards. Firstly, just play through the later stages in the quest. The further you are in the quest, the better chance there is of rare cards dropping during battle. The other option, of course, is to just spend gems opening the algebraic chest, but since gems are a premium currency and are hard to come by for free, that's not a great option. It is a quick one, though. Indeed. And finally, if you can place in the top ten of a Deck Wars tournament, you'll score a nice rare card. And if you place number one, you get a super rare black card, which costs zero magic to play. Whoa. <laughs> well, uh, let's move on to this one now from Cleopatra in ancient Egypt, Melbourne, the opposite of French Perth, uh, which is also in Victoria. There's an ancient Egypt, Melbourne? Uh, yes, it's, it's in Victoria, but it's the opposite of French Perth. Oh, that's confusing. Hey, we can go there and learn how to dance. Why? How to do the Egyptian dance. <gasps> the Egyptian <laughs> dance. Oh, way, oh, everyone's da, 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 gonna do da, da, da. the dance now. In Melbourne. In Melbourne. Have a nice coffee. <laughs> Hello, GGSP. I have three ancient questions for you. One, what are some good Kinect games for the Xbox 360? To what was the first video game ever? Three, do you know what anti disestablishment terrorism means? Thanks. Now, can all of you do these hieroglyphs for me? <laughs> 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 Thanks, Cleo out. Well, Cleo, I think our favourite Kinect games for the 360 include the very colourful on-rail shooter, Child of Eden, the fruit-chopping carnage of Fruit Ninja Kinect, the sporty mini-games of Kinect Sports, the funky booty shaking of Dance Central and the furry friends of Connectimals. And we had a bit of fun with that Pixar Connect game, didn't we? Mm. Uh, it was called uh, Connect Rush, I think. Mm, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 that was pretty good too, as far as Connect games go. Mm. As for the first video game ever, I'm pretty sure it was that Tennis for Two game, wasn't it? Mm. It was basically a rudimentary version of Pong, but played on scientific equipment. Mm. Well, you know what? I think we should double check that with Darren. He always knows that kind of mm. stuff. Hello, Darren speaking. Hi, Darren, it's Barjo. Who? Darren, it's Barjo from Good Game. Mm, I think you have the wrong number. Darren? Darren, do you need to reboot? It's Barjo here from Good Game. <laughs> Just trolling, Barjo. Tra -la 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 -la. Uh, of course.
course I know who you are, Bajo. I, I really had you going there, didn't I? Uh, now, uh, what, what can I do for you today? I can't believe I fell for that. What a prankster. <laughs> we were just wondering, was Tennis for Two the first video game ever? Mm, well, Tennis for Two was developed way back in 1952 and is widely acknowledged as one of the first video games. But it's actually predated by what is only known as the cathode ray tube amusement device uh, from 1947. It was inspired by World War II style radar screens and involved a simple game that allowed players to manipulate a small dot on their screen to hit various targets. However, only a handful of prototypes were ever made. Huh. Well, there you go. Interesting little fact there, Darren. Uh, also, while you're here, do you know what anti-disestablishmentarianism is? Oh, of course. It's a political view that originated in 19th century Britain. The disestablishment was a movement to remove the Anglican Church from its status as the State Church of England. And anti-disestablishmentarians simply disagreed with this movement. Anti-disestablishmentarianism is also one of the longest words in the English language. It's also quite fun to say. Thanks oh, for that, Darren. <laughs> uh, wait, before you go, Darren, uh, this next question here says you were wrong. <laughs> I, I highly doubt it, Hex. Uh, well, it's from Unknown, who is uh, somewhere in Western Australia. Maybe in French Perth. I was wondering if you could tell me if Mario 64 for DS is any good so I can know to save my money. Thanks, Unknown. P.S. Darren was wrong about Tails' full name. It is Miles Tails Prower, so he should take a drink from the noob cup. Wow, Darren, you just got noob slam. <laughs> Will you be partaking from the noob cup? Negative. Tails is simply his nickname, not one of his given names. Uh, so his name is officially Miles Prower. However, nicknames are often added into the middle of a name in inverted commas, which would make him Miles Tails Prower. It's simply a stylized version of his name, however, not his actual name. Oh, fair enough, Darren. It's kind of like my name is Stephanie Hex Bendixson and your name is Stephen Barjo O'Donnell. Mm, <laughs> this is true. Oh, well, uh, as for Mario 64 DS and if it's any good, well, we'd have to say absolutely yes. Mario 64 is one of the best platforms ever made and the DS version of it is a great port, so we'd highly recommend it. Hmm. Uh, can I go now? Oh, uh, just one more thing, Darren. Um, this next question also claims you were wrong. <laughs> oh, preposterous! Uh, well, it's from Benji in Melbourne, Victoria. Warm up your receptacles, Darren, because you're about to get noob slammed oh, for a second slammed. time. Negative! <laughs> Come on and slam, and welcome to the jam! Jam the slam noob, jam. All right, just read the question. Dear GGSP, last week when Darren did that report on Polybius, I asked my mum to look it up on Google and she found on Wikipedia that it was fictional and only an urban legend. You are also incorrect when you said that there were no pictures of the Polybius Arcade game as we found them on Google Images. Can you please give a quick glimpse of Captain Toad Treasure Tracker? Thanks from Benji. Ooh. <laughs> well, what do you have to say about that, Darren? Slam the noob slam. Yeah. Well, Benji, in my report, I quite clearly state it is widely regarded as an urban legend and is likely not a true story. But if it isn't real, how did you find pictures of it? Mm? Well, I guess if there are pictures of it, then it has to be real, right? <laughs> oh, you poor naive human. Those pictures are more than likely nothing more than pictures of fake recreations of the mythical cabinet, not proof that it ever really existed. You can't believe everything on the internet. Yeah, but you also said that it could be real and that we may never know the truth. Well, it could be real. You can't prove that it wasn't, can you? <laughs> and remember, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, Hex. The truth is out there. Uh, well, anyway, I have to get the Den of Gaming ready for the next Naruto review, so uh, you two put on your ninja headbands and I'll see you there. Oh, oh okay. see you soon, Darren. Hmm. Right, well, uh, oh yes, also you wanted to see a sneak peek of Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, so here it is. Oh, yeah. All right, well, I think on that note, we're out of time for this week, and don't forget you can send your questions here. Naruto away! We're wearing like a little headband like this. Think it looks good like this? Or should I wear it further down? Okay guys, time to get our jutsu on with Naruto. Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm Revolution is the latest game based on the popular anime and manga series. 
And it is the sequel to the 2013 release, Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm 3. Yes, and like other Naruto games, Ninja Storm Revolution is a third-person fighting game with a few RPG elements on the side. The main game type is an event-based mode called Ninja World Tournament. Your aim is to progress through the difficulty divisions by competing in a series of rounds with multiple fighters. <laughs> I take you to list other characters to your roster. This is done by free roaming about the island and talking to all the potential candidates. Yes, and these usually require you to pass a test or a mission to win them over. I quite like these guys. I felt like I was trying to prove myself to them. No, affirmative. All the faces will be familiar to fans of the series, such as Kakashi and Yamato. This instalment also includes several all-new side stories about the Akatsuki, the criminal ninja organisation in the Naruto series. Yes, and you actually play from the Akatsuki perspective, which I found very interesting. This campaign involves you recruiting members for your cause, which is well peace, I think. The difference here for recruitment is that you have to convince these potential members to join you, which really just means beat them in a fight until they yield. <laughs> Now, I have some good news for Naruto fans. There's 40 minutes of footage that has never been seen before in the anime. Uh, 46 minutes to be precise. Oh, thanks, Darren. <laughs> Anytime, Bajo. Ninja Storm Revolution also has a separate original story featuring none other than Mecha Naruto, who is basically a roboticized version of Naruto. <laughs> uh, this campaign follows Naruto and Mecha Naruto as they team up together in a tournament to win the prize. The prize itself is a mental stone, which will help Mecha Naruto retrieve his memory. Yeah, and I think it's cool that they've added this whole separate original campaign, but I always find Amnesia such a cheap storytelling mechanic. Yeah, absolutely. Also, I'm not really a Naruto expert on the universe itself, so quite a lot of the time I had no idea what was going on story-wise. <laughs> There's also quite a lot of dialogue to sit through, and some of it gets a bit awkward. Yeah, Mecha Naruto certainly had some weird moments, but that could just be because he was a robot. Hmm. No offence, Darren. Hmm. All right, guys, let's talk about the combat. It's fairly similar to past Naruto games. Each character will have their own unique attacks, but they're all executed the same way. There are a couple of new additions with this instalment. First of all, guard break and the counter attack. And like with most fighters, it can be quite difficult mastering all of the various attacks and combos. I thought the animations here were brilliant. Yeah, those special attacks look fantastic for each character. Oh, and those ultimate jutsus. What a way to end a fight. I never stop until I catch up to him. Game over. Uh, the combat can feel a bit spammy at times. I found it particularly prominent here as I found myself hitting the attack button non-stop. Yeah, you can say that about a lot of fighters, though, I think, Darren. Through practice, you can begin to nail those complex combos. However, the tutorials were pretty dull. They're just text boxes, which adds even more reading to the game. But we should wrap this up. I thought the visuals were stunning, especially for a last-gen console. And I think fans will get a lot out of this game, so I'm giving it 7 out of 10 rubber chickens. I think this is a decent fighting game at its core, but those RPG elements felt a little bit tacked on to me. I'm going to give this one 6.5. Believe it! Mm. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. But, Darren, please, the answer to your challenge. Affirmative. This week I asked you which home console launched with the game Fusion Frenzy. The answer is... the first Xbox. Well, thanks for that, Darren. Now, of course, next week on the show, exciting times, it's our 200th episode of Spawn Point. Hooray! We better start going through all of these birthday cards, you guys. That's right, someone's going to win a console. Oh, so many letters, they all love me. Oh. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Banjo out. Darren out. Oh, where do we start? Oh, look at this one, Darren, it's you. Oh, oh, that's quite a good likeness, Darren. Detail. Quite good. Oh, there's some stuff going on inside there. And let's see what else have we got. <gasps> this one's got glitter on it. Oh, oh. Negative glitter. Oh, 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 oh,